uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning, good evening, uh, depending on which time zone and which part of the world you are joining from. And it's my uh, distinct honor and pleasure to welcome all of you for uh, this yet another session of uh, clinical research landscape in Pakistan organized by the APNA Merit Medical Education Research International Training and Transfer of Technology uh, Subcommittee. Uh, my name is Sarfraz Asni, and I apologize that uh, you are able to see my institute, but you're not able to see me due to some video uh, difficulties. But um, I'm the director of uh, Lupus uh, Clinical Research at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And I've been involved with the clinical research for over a decade, and also been involved with APNA with various uh, uh, research endeavors and various uh, research uh, projects that they've been ongoing. And uh, I'm, I'm very uh, closely involved with this uh, clinical research landscape series, uh, very near and dear to my heart. And we are hoping that uh, through these uh, series, we will be able to um, inculcate uh, some of the research activities in the major institutes of um, Pakistan. And uh, with that process, we have been going from um, uh, north to south, east to west, different parts of Pakistan, and, and going through major institutes and universities. And today, of course, uh, one of the best, uh, Adha Khan University in Karachi, is going to present uh, the clinical landscape uh, from their part. And we have two um, wonderful speakers uh, from the Khan, and I will introduce both of them. First, and I believe the first is Dr. Asad Ali, who is the Associate Dean of Research at AKU Medical College, Pakistan. A brief intro about uh, Asad is that uh, Dr. Asad Ali is um, and the Nuruddin Nur Muhammad Sharif and our Chair Professor in Department of Pediatrics and Child Health. And his uh, research interests pertain broadly to pediatric public health in developing countries, especially infectious diseases, vaccines, and childhood malnutrition. And he has received uh, many awards for his research contributions, including the AQ-wide award for research excellence in 2022. Our next speaker will be Dr. Saeed uh, Hameen. And Dr. Saeed Hameen is the professor of Department of Medicine. And he's also the director of clinical trials unit at AKU in Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, formerly, he was a chief of Department of Medicine for over a decade. And he's trained in uh, medicine and gastroenterology with a specific focus on hepatology. Uh, and he has trained abroad in UK as well as in Texas Southwestern Medical College in Dallas. Uh, he has been vice president and, uh, of Pakistan Society for uh, Gastroenterology and the president of Pakistan Society for the Study of Liver Disease, um, and also chair of hepatology interest group for the World uh, Gastroenterology Organization. Um, also in multiple other Asian, Asia Pacific, as well as world organizations related to the um, hepatitis and gastroenterology, especially hepatitis C. Um, and of course, uh, he has a very long list of accomplishments and, uh, and his, uh, his affiliations, but uh, you know, in the interest of time, we'll just make it brief. Um, his main research interests are viral hepatitis and liver failure, and has authored close to 200 uh, publications and book chapters. So with that uh, brief intro, um, I would like to again welcome and thank both Dr. Asad Ali and Dr. Saeed Hamid for their time and, then, and, and their presentation. So uh, I think, uh, Asad, uh, you are up first, so I'll hand it over to you. Please take it away. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Fraz, uh, for the very kind introduction. Folks, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm very thankful to the APNA Merit Subcommittee for this opportunity to um, tell you guys a little bit about uh, what we have been doing at Aga Khan University, who we are, uh, what we do, what we value, and then um, absolutely would love to have any opportunity of working together and collaborate. I'll be sharing my screen. And uh, what I will do is uh, because uh, uh, so all right. So what uh, the way uh, me and uh, Professor Saeed Hamid have uh, divided our presentation, I'll be giving a broader overview of the overall research landscape of the medical college, Aga Khan Medical College, and then um, Dr. Saeed will be focusing on the clinical trials element uh, of uh, our portfolio. 
So overall, um, we are guided by the vision of our chancellor and uh, our own vision uh, is to be an autonomous international institution of distinction, primarily serving the developing world and Muslim societies in innovative and enduring ways. So overall, everything we do at AKU is kind of guided by the four core principles. And we have an abbreviation of IKRA uh, for that. IKRA stands for uh, Impact, Quality, Relevance, and Access. So this is kind of what we, what we do overall. And this is reflected in our clinical mission, in our education mission, and uh, in our uh, research mission. So overall, Aga Khan University is a multi-continental university. We are not just in Pakistan, uh, but we are also in East Africa. Actually, right now I am in Kenya visiting them, uh, but uh, otherwise I'm based in Pakistan. Uh, so in Pakistan, we within the Aga Khan University, we have a medical college. We have a school of nursing and midwifery. We have the hospital, we have the Institute for Educational Development, and we have the examination board. So this is how we are kind of contributing. In East Africa, similarly, we have a very major presence. And these are all the schools that we have in here. We also have Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilization, which is based in UK. And then in Afghanistan, uh, we work with the French Medical Institute for Mothers and Children in Kabul. And this is basically run um, by our university and our folks in here. So this is kind of like the overall landscape that we have. Uh, we are very proud that, uh, you know, uh, we are a relatively younger university, just going to be celebrating our 40th year uh, of uh, existence uh, next year. Uh, and uh, already we are ranked among the top 100 universities for clinical medicine in the world, according to the Shanghai ranking. And um, this is something that we are very happy about. So this is kind of the medical college leadership. I, uh, you know, we are, our dean is Dr. Adil Heather, uh, who also um, kind of was based in the US before he moved uh, back to Pakistan about three years ago. And this is the rest of the, you know, the associate deans. I am the associate dean for research. I also actually trained in the U.S. Uh, I did my training in at Duke University in pediatrics, then went to Vanderbilt University for my pediatric infectious diseases and then master's in public health. And then I came back in around uh, 2009. And uh, since then, I have been here at the Aga Khan University. Uh, these are our different chairs of the department that we have. Uh, and um, so overall, these are the departments that we have, uh, just kind of like any other uh, US uh, medium-sized uh, university uh, medical college. Uh, we have all the major departments and uh, uh, about 500 plus uh, faculty. These are the programs that we have. And uh, in the undergraduate, we have the, uh, the MBBS program and the, 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 the dental hygiene program uh, in the medical college. And then we have different graduate programs in the medical college. Uh, these include the master's in epidemiology and biostatistics. This is a very much uh, well sought out program, MSc health policy and management, uh, master's of health professional education. And then we do MPhil uh, in biological and biomedical sciences and our PhD program. Uh, then obviously we have a very strong postgraduate medical education program of uh, internship, residency, and fellowships. Uh, we are uh, one of we you know there are many many fellowships which have been pioneered uh, for the first time uh, in Pakistan by our university, uh, and uh, you know we have very good relationship with the CPSP and all, and they often are very uh, helpful in kind of taking the new specialties forward when it comes from our university. So research is one of the major pillars of our university. We are we always call ourselves a research-led university. This is something that we take pride in. And uh, creating new knowledge uh, is something that uh, we is very much part of our mission. Um, we what I often say is that we are a first world institution in a developing world setting. 
so 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 much of our infrastructure which i'll tell you about is uh, of uh, at par uh, with the first world our faculty and all are many of them are those who were at very high ranks in the us and then all our local trained faculty also is no way uh, you know is as good uh, if not better than uh, you know our internationally trained faculty and uh, so 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 and and then the systems that we have for research uh, for governance which i'll tell you about again kind of uh, make us um, at par with any uh, top university around the world but the setting that we operate in is hardcore developing world setting so this provides us a great opportunity of actually bridging the first world and the developing world and uh, this is one of the reasons why we have been uh, so successful in terms of our research output both in terms of research funding as well as uh, research output in terms of uh, publications and then uh, impact on policy so we are uh, you know just uh, our portfolio uh, encompasses uh, community based research and this is something that we have a particular niche in uh, because of our uh, geographical uh, position then hospital based research and then also uh, we have very strong infrastructure and human resource for basic and, and translational research. Uh, I'll tell you a lot about uh, what we have been doing and uh, over the past uh, five to 10 years, which really have facilitated the research and researchers uh, at our university, which has led to significant increase in the overall research uh, portfolio. So in terms of our core infrastructure, uh, we have a BSL-2 and BSL-3 uh, labs, uh, 36 bench spaces. We have a state-of-the-art center for regenerative medicine with really cutting edge facilities. Our grants management infrastructure is actually one of our strongest suit, which gives us the credibility with international funders that they trust us with their money because they know that the regulatory system is exactly what they would expect in any of the first world institution. Our ethical review uh, committee is very strong. Um, in fact, we are one of the pioneers of actually um, kind of introducing all of this review system in Pakistan. Many, many other institutions uh, have their leads, uh, which were uh, originally either kind of like trained at Aga Khan University or at least influenced by them. And then the SOPs that we develop uh, are the ones that we are very happy to share with everybody else. Uh, our animal house uh, is also uh, has uh, ability to uh, do a lot of we and we do experiments on uh, many different kinds of animals. We have a very robust intramural research funding system. And then, of course, we are very proud of our clinical trials unit, which is led by Professor Saeed Hamid whom you would listen from in a minute. This is what I want to, you know, this is perhaps something that would be very in, uh, that the participants would be very interested in. And this is an exercise we did about three, four years ago, in which we really wanted to give uh, and, uh, you know, show to a person like yourself, who may be in another country, but who wants to know uh, that, you know, who in my field, who is the person really, interested in who are the teams that are interested uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in 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 research in my subject area so for that what we did is that we created research groups and research groups were basically made uh, were these were the uh, for a group to be made multiple faculties who have been working in one particular theme had to come together and uh, kind of you know open themselves up for international collaboration so it's very easy for you to go and see so if you just open any of a browser so let's open a browser in here and uh, then if you just google uh, let's say research groups uh, AKUMC. Then you will come in here. And if you come in here,
So this will uh, pop up this page, okay? And here you will have all these research groups that are there. So let's pick any, okay? So let's pick, uh, for example, let's say that you are an antimicrobial resistance person, or let's say you are a colorectal cancer person, or any of these fields, uh, you can have a look, you may be a mental health guy. Uh, and let's say if you open this up, any of these, then these will be, this is how the, the groups are all kind of listed in the same format. So about the group kind of tells you what uh, they have. These are the aims and objectives of the group, uh, the research themes. This is what they work on. This is the membership. These are the different people uh, in this group. Uh, these are the grants that the group has um, currently or so far. These are the projects that the, uh, they are currently working on. Engagement, public health. Contact gives you the name of the person uh, who is the uh, point person uh, on this uh, and, 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 and all. And then, um, uh, you know, a list of publications. So this is a good source for people anywhere in the world uh, that, you know, in any institution that you may be. So you can pick anything. So for example, if you are interested in microbiome uh, or uh, let's pick uh, any other thing, let's say colorectal cancer, uh, the same format will be there. And uh, you can just kind of, you know, pick uh, who is the member uh, in here and you can, uh, you know, and there will be a contact down here. Uh, and you can see who is the lead and this is the person. So these are the people who would be, uh, uh, these are the people who would be already, you know, passionate about this topic. And, uh, you know, the best collaborations happen one-on-one. Uh, -on -one, and, uh, and this is a way by which you can uh, connect with them. So our funders, we are very fortunate. We have both Pakistani funders, but our primary funding uh, is extramural and, uh, and United States is actually one of many, many of our funders are based in the United States. Uh, we get quite a bit of funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, from the USNIH and all. We have multiple R awards. We have K awards. Uh, that we have uh, in here. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, of course, is a big one. And then uh, we have uh, funding from the Welcome Trust in the UK uh, and, you know, a lot of uh, other organizations. So uh, although our primary campus is in Karachi, but, you know, for our community-based work, we are spread all over uh, the, the country, essentially. And uh, in the current floods, uh, I am happy to share that we basically kind of pivoted our research infrastructure, which was uh, spread all over the country and, you know, pivoted that to provide uh, 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 health camps and relief work, which has been much appreciated by everybody. For COVID-19, this was our uh, period that, you know, we took uh, advantage of this calamity and uh, really produced a lot of new knowledge out of this uh, and overall about more about 100 and more than 135 publications uh, in 2021 on COVID and then uh, 14 extramural grants. This is something that I'm really proud of and I'm happy to share with you. Overall, these are new grants that have been received by our by AKU faculty, uh, new grants per year. And as you can see uh, that we have had about five uh, X increase in the new grants uh, in the past five years or so. So last year we were almost touching $50 million of new grants uh, that uh, we have uh, received. And these are the different funders. So this kind of just shows the trust of the, uh, of the funders uh, and the quality of the research proposals that are able to come out. And of course, much of our research is collaborative and we are always uh, looking forward to collaborators. Uh, and uh, those research groups are very much always looking for collaborators uh, with which we can combine our expertise and apply for uh, strong proposals. This is our publication um, kind of thing. We track this very carefully and I'm happy to share that uh, you know, uh, last year we were averaging about eighty publications uh, in index journals from our, uh, you know, about five hundred or so faculty uh, that we have 
uh, in here. So this all graph is also kind of going up and all. So overall, folks, I'll uh, and you know um, there are systems, the ethical review system, and uh, and uh, you know we basically are uh, registered with all the. Uh, with the entities that register the ethical review IRBs in the US and we have those same accreditation and and all in terms of you know as you can imagine since we have a significant amount of NIH funding we, we follow the same regulations uh, that you all do in the US and uh, uh, over here also as you can see in the last two three years we really have improved our systems uh, uh, developed new uh, or brought in new softwares uh, which have helped us track the applications and respond to them in a timely manner with accountability and this spirit uh, we are actually implementing in all our research processes so that uh, you know uh, there is a strong regulation of research and at the sa same time there is strong facilitation of research so this is my last slide. I'll hand over to Professor Saeed Hamid, but in the end, I'll just say that, you know, I'm thrilled uh, to be presenting this to our own people. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I very much see APNA as one of the, our own organization. Uh, I was myself the member of APNA when I was uh, in the US, and I think there is nothing better. I mean, we collaborate with a lot of universities in the US, and I think we would uh, love in nothing better then uh, collaborate with our own uh, folks uh, in there. And if you uh, if you would like, please contact me, Professor Saeed Hamid, or, uh, or you could also, you might also want to directly contact uh, your partner researchers uh, that are listed in there. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll stop now and uh, hand over to Professor Saeed Hamid. Uh, sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much, Asad. That was that was a very nice beginning, and uh, uh, very pleased that you are have been a part of this uh, progress, uh, an integral part of this progress. I must say, uh, of course, what we missed to mention is that uh, Asad is also one of our uh, alumnus of the medical college, and really is it is a pleasure to see uh, how our alumni have come back, and they are now. Uh, contributing to the development of the university and and much beyond uh, to to the to the hopefully to the whole of the country right so my uh, focus will be on the uh, clinical trials part uh, of the of the presentation uh, and i'll just take you through this uh, quickly if i can move my slide which i can't so i think i'll have to go to the other one Okay, that's better. So, just to introduce the the the, the CTU to do to, to you, this is as Asada said, uh, one of the one of the, uh, the the great hallmarks of of the university is that hopefully whatever we do, we try at least try ourselves to do it at an international level and an international scale. Uh, and I can safely say about the CTU that I think we are uh, a, an international level facility. Uh, we are a composite, well-equipped facility, which 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 can deal with from end-to-end -end contact of phase one to phase four uh, clinical trials. We've been operational since 2012. We were fully licensed by DRAP in October 2019 when all this the the the, the regulation the the licensing of the sites started. And as has been mentioned, we have large number of international collaborations. Uh, on the hospital side, the, the, the CTU sits between the hospital and the medical college. It is an academic facility, uh, so it is mostly the medical college. But of course, because it's a clinical facility, it also it, it interacts with the, with the hospital. So uh, as part of the Joint Commission International Accreditation, uh, we have been uh, uh, reviewed uh, for the last two times for the for the J from JCI as an academic medical center, and that includes human subjects research. And I'm pleased to say to you that uh, the CTU passed both these uh, these uh, on both these occasions without really any observations whatsoever. So that was that was heartening. We are a relatively small uh, uh, facility in terms of full-time staff, but we have a good number of trial-related staff, 
uh, that helps in our in our daily uh, uh, daily work. Uh, this is just the organogram. As I said, as I as the director uh, report to the dean and the CEO of the hospital, mostly to the dean because of the, the academic nature of the work that we do. Uh, we have uh, two managers. We have a research manager and we have a business development and finance manager. And under them, there are the clinical administrative teams, the lab management, the drug management, all the paraphernalia that you need to, that you need for running clinical trials. And then we have study-based teams, for example, for each each grant we, uh, that, that, that we that we employ. Let me give you a run around, uh, just a visual run around through the, through the CTU. I understand that some members from this, uh, the, from this audience today, uh, Dr. Ozair and others will be in, at AKU in November, and it will be a real pleasure for our team to show you around physically uh, in the CTU when you're there. So we start off with the reception, people report, uh, subjects report here. We are, our, all our systems are very well integrated with the hospital management systems. For example, uh, the, the lab, the, 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 the registration of people, the, the, the medical record number generation, et cetera, et cetera. So when they report here, they are checked in, they, they get an armband with a, with, a, uh, with a barcode on it, which then uh, uh, takes them through all of their activity that happens in the CTU. Uh, of course, the, the, the first part of any clinical trial is to obtain consent, which is what is being done here, uh, then an assessment, then an examination room uh, with history and physical examinations being carried out, then blood sampling. We have a, we have a, uh, uh, a small lab, a BCL2 lab, where we can collect samples, store them, and ship them. We don't do uh, much testing here. Although you can see a small little gene expert machine here on which we do quite a bit of our viral uh, uh, RNA and DNA work, uh, but that's about it. It's basically meant to be a, uh, a storage and a facilitation lab for the, for the uh, samples from, from various clinical trials. Of course, we have all the paraphernalia, including a, um, a minus 80 fridge, a minus 20, a number of minus 20 freezers and so on. Uh, our staff is at a trained or at a certified so they can uh, they, 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 they know what, what they're doing when they're transporting these samples. Uh, this is the research pharmacy. Uh, th this only deals with the investigational uh, uh, products, not with the regular uh, pharmacy products. And it is staffed by two of our well-qualified and well-trained pharmacists. Uh, so, so. Uh, we have uh, an infusion bay also where we can keep people uh, over even overnight if necessary. We haven't done so yet, but this is some this is an activity that can be done, um, and and we have yet to start into in, in into this area into phase one studies, for example. Uh, we have a very nice area for our study coordinators to work in. About twenty, we can hold about 20, 25 people here. Uh, and therefore, the, the, this is quite a big area. We have investigator pods where people, investigators that come and do their work. <coughs> As I said, mentioned, there is a uh, quite a rigorous process of taking the trials through the regulatory capacity, so uh, the regulatory uh, system. So we have our internal review mechanism, which is shown on here. Uh, so everything starts from the departmental research committee, which gives a nod to any trial that or study that comes in to say, okay, this can proceed. It comes to the CTU. We work with the investigators uh, to take them through the ethics review committee, uh, through HR, through finance, legal, the research office, the institutional biosafety committee, security and dean and so on. So. It, it seems like a long process, but it runs in tandem and not every, uh, of course, every study needs, uh, uh, for example, an institutional bio safety committee uh, evaluation, et cetera. What most investigators, of course, get stuck in are the HR issues and finance uh, and perhaps sometimes even legal. Uh, so this is where we help them and this is where uh, a system is now being developed to, to tie up the front end with the back end so that the process becomes even more smoother. In the lowest, in the, in the box down below are the extra uh, 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 university external regulatory mechanisms, which includes National Bioethics Committee, uh, the DRAP, and of course, the import license that the DRAP gives uh, for all the uh, investigational products that come in. Um, part of our job is training. We conduct uh, GCP uh, training workshops regularly. 
uh, and also JCIS standards for human subject research are taught to our uh, own people as well as anybody who wishes to attend from the outside. Uh, there is a clinical trial management training workshops, laboratory and technical protocol workshops, etc. So we do provide a significant amount of training. This has been our, <clears throat> our quality journey, not just for the CTU, but also for the whole hospital. We were JCI certified for the first time in 2006. And I was, as I've already said, for the last two years since 2016, uh, we have been uh, evaluated, audited as a, a university medical center, which means that the human subjects research has also been evaluated. Our lab is a CAP accredited College of American Pathologist accredited lab, which I believe is the only one in the country and therefore serves as a reference lab to, to uh, uh, for, for, for many things that happen in the country. For example, the TB program, the HIV program, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> now, let me just take you through some of the things that we've done, I've picked the, the era from 2019 to 22. 2019, of course, I came to the unit and this, so we had a, uh, around shortly after my arrival into the unit, of course, COVID-19 broke through and we had a bit of a bonanza with the COVID-19 trials, as Asad has already mentioned, so that we were able to uh, generate new knowledge and contribute to whatever was going on in the country. Before we started, this was our first effort uh, to, to, get, to get a capacity building grant. This is from PATH, which is a US-based organization, of course, funded uh, by BMGF. And we got this grant to enhance capacity for conducting large throughput vaccine studies. We, we, we uh, refurbished our three sites, the AKU CTU, the Clifton Medical Center, and the Karimabad Hospital, which is a secondary hospital for our uh, for our health services. Uh, we, we developed some facility improvements, lab and pharmacy equipment, HR capacity, teleconferencing, and so on. And more importantly, we got onto the BMGF list of trial-ready global sites that people could use for, the, um, uh, for vaccine trials. Um, and I just uh, picked up a couple of uh, screenshots. I don't know whether they, 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 they appear uh, legible to you, but this is the Global Health Network research side. And if you just look right at the bottom, the Aya Khan University Clinical Trials Unit is mentioned as one of the sites which is uh, ready for a large-scale clinical vaccine trial to come through. And if you go down even uh, 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 more into this, uh, they, 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 they talk about what the facilities are, what the uh, capabilities are, et cetera, et cetera. So this did help us in getting uh, some of the studies that I will talk about. And let me now take you through, uh, I, I cannot give you a full uh, comprehensive list because of lack of time, but let me mention some of the ones, some of the highlights that we, that we have been engaged in in this, uh, in this past two or three years. So the first study, with the, the, with that, the, the COVID study that we did was a consigno vaccine trial, which <laughs> was the largest trial that has been done in Pakistan so far. Uh, we were one of the sites. We contributed 2,900 subjects uh, in about three months or so. So it was a real uh, uh, hassle time for us, but I think we were, we were lucky uh, that we were able to complete this sample size. Since then, there has been a consigno booster uh, supplementary trial to this. Uh, lives on is another uh, vaccine booster study, and we are now really in, into the into the arena of booster vaccinations and uh, booster um, uh, formulations about what to how to best de deliver boosters to, to 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 these people. The rest of the trials are uh, Kopkov is a prophylactic trial with uh, hydroxychloroquine. This was done right initially in the, the start of the. Uh, of the pandemic, um, and we contributed 650 subjects. This was run by Oxford Uni University from UK. You will note that we have two major international sponsors. One are, of course, the, uh, the, the pharma companies, and the others are the big uh, 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 academic institutions throughout the world. Uh, Solidarity from WHO was, again, a adaptive design uh, uh, therapeutic trial, as was the ACT trial, which is the Public Health Research Institute of Canada. And mepuzumab was a monoclonal antibody uh, for severe uh, COVID disease. Uh, things that I've highlighted, I'd just like to concentrate on those a little bit more. Uh, so this was exciting because this was our first uh, vaccine COVID vaccine study, large scale study 
of a recombinant no novel coronavirus uh, adenovector type 5 virus in the adults 18 years of age and older. The global um, uh, sample size was 40,000. Pakistan contributed 10,000. Uh, as I said, AKU contributed 2,900. The outcome has been that this was then a technology transfer, and this was the first and only COVID vaccine to be produced in Pakistan at the NIH, and still has been the workhorse for our, uh, uh, for our um, vaccine studies, uh, vaccination programs. These are some of the, uh, a few of the non-COVID studies that have been going on during this time. Uh, and, and you can note these are, uh, uh, many of these are sponsored by uh, pharma from the US and these are specialized pharmaceutical companies. For example, Synexis um, uh, has this uh, new antifungal uh, uh, molecule called Ibrexafungerp. Uh, which is uh, being used to treat resistant um, uh, Canada albicans and other infections. Uh, a very um, nice molecule as far as we can understand and a very relevant molecule because we have a fair amount of Canada resistance. Uh, this trial is ongoing. D liver is one of my studies that I would like to talk about in a little bit more detail as is ulcerative colitis, which is another new molecule uh, which is being used uh, around the world. <coughs> so D-liver is a phase three registration study of efficacy and safety of an oral drug. Remember, uh, the, the hepatitis delta has been an orphan disease so far, which means that there is no regulated therapy, no approved therapy for, for, for this, uh, for this uh, infection. And therefore, this is the first uh, a trial, large trial of an oral medication combined with PEG interferon alpha that has been used for uh, uh, traditionally for these patients off label, of course, 100 sites across 20 countries. You can imagine how uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 there would have been difficulties in enrolling in these studies. We enrolled 55 out of the 400 global samples. So we were the largest enrollers and I'll tell you in a minute why this was and why this was so exciting to us. Uh, this is now the, the uh, things are completed. People are in post-treatment follow-up. We will have top-line data by the end of this year. Um, we are expecting, we are told that we should expect an FDA um, uh, 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 audit and an FDA inspection because we, we are the largest in loaders. So, uh, so we may have some sleepless nights uh, despite the fact that we did so well in the study. Uh, so the reason why we are interested or why we were interested was the impact that this would have on our patients. As you see on this map, the yellow colored area is the hotspot for us for hepatitis delta, one of the biggest hotspots in the world. And uh, if you look at the figures, these are people, hepatitis B surface antigen positive people who have hepatitis delta go, uh, super infection. Uh, it, uh, remember that hepatitis delta can only exist in patients who have already got hepatitis B infection. And along with those, with, with hepatitis B, it is the severest form of hepatitis that, that faces, that, that mankind faces. And this is a huge population that we have in the yellow colored area. And this has helped us in, in, in getting these new medications and there are others on the way, other, other trials on the way for this, for this group. And hopefully uh, this will have a direct impact on, on, um, um, on these patients. The, uh, the biggest problem with this is it, it attacks young people. So less than 16 years, 11% of this group of people that we looked at who had severe fibrosis, much more severe fibrosis as compared to people who were uh, older in age. These are some of the other uh, uh, ongoing non-COVID studies. I've just highlighted one, which is Refershort. Refershort is sponsored by the St. George's University in London, UK. And the, by its, it, its name, you, you might have realized that this is a TB study. It is a multi-center study, which is evaluating high dose or very high doses of rifampicin daily in the reduction of treatment duration, in resulting in reduction of treatment duration of pulmonary TB from six months to four months. So we are evaluating between 1,200 to 1,800 milligrams uh, of rifampicin daily. Remember the standard dose is 600 milligrams, so this is three times. 
we recruited 35 subjects. Um, we were kind of shaking in our boots when we were doing the study, but uh, thankfully, touch wood, there was only perhaps one SAE where, where the patient developed jaundice, but, uh, but then recovered once the treatment was stopped. So we, we ant ant anticipate uh, good results eventually from this, uh, from this study. Uh, just to mention that the, the, the one highlighted above, the CAT study was the uh, Abbott rapid antigen test of which we were on the only site outside, international site outside the US. So the total sample size of the study was 1500 and we entered about 228 subjects. The outcome was that the FDA approved the, the, the rapid antigen test, which was one of the first ones that was to be approved in the, in the US. There are a number of trials in the pipeline, some of them very interesting, very exciting. For example, this malaria trial, which is a radical cure with tefenequin and primaquin, the effort study. Uh, we are into now ophthalmology studies with age-related macular degeneration. You can, if you see the dates, all these dates are 2022. And of course, everybody realizes that this was a time when the, uh, the, the system wasn't moving and the, uh, the studies were not uh, being approved. Thankfully now, uh, and that this is this is a kind of a boon to this meeting, I guess, and, and the efforts of so many people of this group, uh, that finally we have a clinical studies committee uh, in, uh, in existence, which is now moving quite quickly. What happened in those two years, in, in, that, in that year or, or nine months or 10 months, a few of the studies slipped away. For example, we wanted desperately to do an international level from the uh, Western world uh, COVID-19 studies, Sanofi Pasture approached us. We were in advanced stages of, of, uh, of development of this protocol, but the end, uh, we, we did not get through. Similarly, a study on the immunogenicity and safety of heterologous prime boost combinations of available COVID-19 vaccines in Pakistan, the combat study uh, did not get approved in time and the sponsor withdrew uh, their funding. One little uh, caveat is that there are very few national pharma driven research. I personally would like to see much more uh, national pharma driven research, which will have, uh, I suppose, a smaller impact, but a, but a significant impact on how we treat our patients uh, given the uh, uh, tools that we have. So we have been busy since 2019. We have really uh, uh, generated a lot of funding so that our total funding now stands at three and a half million dollars almost. 2022 has not been a good year for obvious reasons, but hope, hopefully uh, this will now pick up. However, and relevant to this group, I think is the th are the things that we are missing in all this good news or reasonable news that I've been trying to, 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 yeah, to take across. So we are missing oncology trials, we are missing diabetes and endocrine trials. 25% of our population is diabetic or pre-diabetic with high levels of metabolic syndromes and resultant cardiovascular disease. Uh, there needs to be better coordination and easier regulatory pathways in, in all the external regulators that we have talked about. And faculty has been willing to, should be willing to engage. There have been some enabling factors which are important to mention. And that is one of them is the presence of international CROs in the country now, at least there may be one or two um, who are very active and who are, are good advocates across the, across the globe. Of course, we have all kinds of all classes and kinds of patients uh, and a wide spectrum of disease, as you've already heard. Uh, the faculty to, to be get, get involved are sometimes a little bit reluctant, but they are getting there. I think we are, we are now um, uh, that they're getting enticed with these major publications that are coming through already. There are at least two Lancet publications from the, uh, from the work that I've mentioned. And there will be a slew of publications in the next few uh, uh, year or two from the studies that have already been done. The lowest, the, the bottom one is our totally homegrown publication in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, from the Department of Pediatrics uh, in, in 2020, which was a randomized trial of moxicillin for pneumonia in young kids in Pakistan. Finally, just a couple of slides. Asad already mentioned this. What does the future look like for us? We have an excellent setup for regenerative medicine and stem cell research. 
that we would like to introduce and we do want to introduce to people as much as possible. This is the vision. We are somewhere in 2018. We had a, we, we, we got a, a, a collaboration going with the UCSF, which is now starting to mature. So there is, uh, there is the, now the desire to try and enroll in clinical trials. And we know that there are some stem cells for treating blood disorders, which are already in the clinical arena uh, and more are coming. More importantly, if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, you look at the US, two, nearly 3,000 studies are registered in, in clinicaltrials.gov from the US alone. Very few studies, only four from, from, uh, from India, none from Pakistan. Now, the, the, all of these studies are not exactly uh, uh, cutting edge studies, but still many of them are. And this is something that we would like to be part of. There is a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, various uh, funny things happening in this area. And therefore one has to be careful about how you proceed with this. Having said that, there is money available. This is just a recent grant that was given to UCSF Children's Hospital, $17 million in grants to come up with a gene editing technology uh, to correct sickle cell uh, anemia. And uh, you can well imagine that sickle cell anemia is important for us as well. So with that, I would like to thank you very much. And this is an aerial view of a campus some times ago. It has now grown up uh, even more. The buildings are there. Unfortunately, the green spaces are getting less and less, but still it is a beautiful campus to visit and it will be a great pleasure to welcome you all over there sometime. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sayyid Amid and Dr. Asad Ali. This was a wonderful overview and uh, a remarkable achievement by the Institute for, uh, in terms of clinical research. And uh, I know the resources are somewhat limited, uh, but at the same time, you all have been able to do uh, multiple uh, important clinical studies and uh, establish these collaborations with uh, both nationally and internationally. So kudos to you and your team, Dr. Saidam. Um, <clears throat> so with this, uh, I will now um, ask our panelists to please, uh, uh, if there are any questions or to uh, share their views about it. So Dr. Omar, Dr. Uzair, and um, I don't know if uh, others are there in the panelists, but uh, please go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Sarfraz. First of all, I will request Professor Sarvath Hussain because he has a lot of emotional engagement with Aya Khan University for his comment and share his views, please. Dr. Sarvath, please. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Ji. Uh, this is Sarvath Hussain. I, it's extremely nostalgic for me to uh, visit the campus virtually and I, uh, uh, some of some of people in uh, Aga Khan might know that I joined Aga Khan University as the in 1984 and left in 1991 uh, in radiology, uh, the first chairman of radiology, and uh, obviously the <clears throat> it is very uh, heartening, interesting, and nostalgic to see as to the vision that His uh, Highness uh, imparted at the beginning. And in fact, it's, uh, you know, to the dot is, uh, is being realized by, you know, the leaders uh, such as Dr. Asad Ali. Um, I don't know which year Dr. Asad Ali graduated, but uh, he, he could have been at the time when I was still there. And uh, Professor uh, uh, Saeed Hamid, I've heard lots and lots of good things about him. And today I can uh, testify to his uh, really, really outstanding and, and breathless uh, accomplishments that he has, uh, he has led at the, at the university. So it, is, it really is uh, very heartening that at least uh, in part, I can uh, claim to be a, 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 an Aga Khan, not an alumnus, but as a, you know, a pre, a old faculty. And, uh, you know, like, like, like it was envisaged that in uh, mid 80s that um, this university is going to be, uh, you know, as all other uh, Aga Khan institution is going to be the, the beacon of whatever it does. 
and I remember that uh, at one of at the inauguration, one of the international uh, uh, woman uh, reporter asked me. He said, "Well, where will where are you going to find the um, faculty from? Where do you?" And I I I told her at that time. Uh, because the our own students, when they go out, they will come back to become our faculty. And to that, she answered. I still remember. You have answered for you have answer for everything. I said, well, uh, you know, the time will tell. So, and you know, this time is is really very very proud uh, time and proud moment for me to be at least uh, a small part of this uh, university. And congratulations to both. Uh, professors uh, uh, Said Hamid and Professor Asad Ali, fantastic. I really, really, it's fantastic. Cannot, just, cannot just, a, just a couple of comments very quickly, Professor Sarvat. I joined in November 1990. So our paths, as, as a very young senior instructor in, in the Department of Medicine, uh, and uh, our paths did cross a little while, although you may not remember me from, from, from that time, but it is such a pleasure uh, to see you and hear you on this on this forum, uh, I wasn't expecting that, and it is it is wonderful to see you here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Sarvat. We have uh, with us Professor Zulfikar Bhutta. I think um, Aga Khan University and Dr. Bhutta go hand in hand. You know, if you introduce Dr. Bhutta, they talk about the Aga Khan University, and if you talk about the Aga Khan University, people talk about Dr. Bhutta. So, Professor Zulfikar Bhutta, please unmute yourself and uh, please. Join. Oh, there you exaggerate enormously. I, mean, uh, I am, uh, but one of one of the many who have contributed to AKU. So, say that I'm, I'm sitting in a lounge in Lahore on my way to Karachi, and right. uh, per fortune I've been able to attend this, which I really wanted to. So, let me tell you, I spoke to, for chance, the SEPI chief executive and the chair of the board just two nights ago in London. And I thought they would be very well aware of the disaster in terms of CEPI's pulling out of the mega million dollar trial of vaccines in Pakistan. Right. Right. Yet they had no awareness. They absolutely did not recollect. And that basically means that in the wider scheme of things, if things don't happen, people will not do AKU or any other organization a favor. So my question is related to what I just posted in the Q&A. What are the regulatory and procedural bottlenecks that AKU has encountered in undertaking vaccine and drug trials in the last few years? And if you have any suggestions or solutions regarding this, what are those? Because all of us want to see research expand in Pakistan, not just to the, you know, the very small amounts $3 million in three years is really nothing to write home about. But if we want to see that grow to $30 million or $50 million, the CEPI grant, as I recall, was $15 million. That's not 11. small. $11 million or whatever. But yeah. the thing is, what, what is it that we as AKU and well-wishers of AKU can do to help this? And have you identified one, two, three, four measures, priority measures that should be done to take this forward? Thank you. Thank you, Zulfikar, for your uh, for your presence and for your comments. So, uh, when COVID arrived, I think everybody put pulled pulled up their sleeves and went to work. Um, I remember uh, Asad uh, uh, re-engineering the ethics review committees. So instead of one committee, we went to four committees at, at, at on 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 campus, and that really expedited the work that was uh, due to these committees. So we cut our, our, our time down to the bare minimum, with the intramural time down to bare minimum. The NBC has always been a very um, uh, uh, slick organization, I think, so far. And, and so therefore we've, we've encountered not a great deal of difficulty from them. Uh, unfortunately, uh, DRAP has not been such a such a happy story for various reasons. One, they have a, a total lack of manpower. If you look at the Clinical Studies Committee, this is serviced by just one or two people who are then overwhelmed with the amount of work that they have to do in terms of the uh, the, the, the regulatory processes. And, and those, those regulatory processes are by no means simple. They are the very, very tough. Secondly, I think 
the DRAP Clinical Sciences Committee is geared very much towards the pharma pharmacists and towards, towards pharmacological sciences. And that's not what the essence of the clinical trials is, as you would know. It is, of course, important, but it is not the only element. And every time you get comments from these, uh, from, from honorable members, these are mostly related to, uh, to, to minor regulatory, which we think are minor regulatory things. For example, a drug that is already a competitor that is already being used in the in, in the wider world. They still want to see a manufacturing license. They still want to see this, that, and the other. We just uh, it it doesn't really make sense. So I think. But, but say one. Uh, sorry to interrupt. One question is: Why is everything going to drop? You know, in, right. in the exactly. previous uh, exactly. health task force, one of the questions we had raised is: My yeah. understanding yeah. is the drop committee should only be looking at either new molecules or new inter applications for existing drugs that have never been tested before. But again, if there are things that are already in the market approved, right. and we are looking at newer ways of doing things or newer formulations, a little bit like Pfizer's study, why right. the heck should anything go to drop at all? Absolutely. That was my next point. And, and it, is, it is extremely important that we, we, we discuss this as reasonable people. This is not directed against an organization or a group of people and so on. This is directed more towards our external collaborators who wish to have things done. Uh, as you know, the, 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 uh, the, the life of the clinical trials pre-trial is extremely short. Everybody wants to get on with it as soon as possible. I mean, people think that a day lost is lo like losing a million dollars to them. Uh, so uh, that, that sense of urgency has to be realized in, 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 our, in our setup, of course. Unfortunately, that is still a problem. You know, I think the, the both of you gentlemen are really echoing what I have been stressing on. I mean, even Bill and Melinda Gate, I have been on their committee recently. We were talking about trials in Pakistan. Their first one, it's very unpredictable. We don't do the work where we cannot estimate or plan the things. So this is one of the key areas you both are touching upon. Thank you. I think one thing important is that, you know, this is a, a challenge that many uh, countries that develop new systems suffer from, that the institutions, uh, you know, they, they do what they are intended to do, and that is all sounds good, but they also do what they are not intended to do. So, so that's why they say that you have to think three times more about the unintended consequences of any initiative you make. Uh, three times more about the unintended in consequences uh, as compared to the intended consequences. So any any system that you develop, you have to make sure that the, that it doesn't become uh, a, a blocking point uh, in here. And I think that's where we suffer with many of these um, entities that we don't um, kind of anticipate or mitigate the unanticipated adverse events and. Uh, that is true for many organizations. Thank you. <clears throat> we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is, um, I know of a new newly established department in a hospital in Pakistan looking for designing SOPs. As Dr. Said mentioned in his presentation, who or where should be contacted to get training in SOPs or seeking assistance in this regard? Uh, I will. Uh, I can leave uh, the address of our ma research manager of the CTU, and I'm sure Asad will also have some uh, some some people that can be contacted. If these per SOPs pertain particularly to clinical trials, we'll be very happy to help. Uh, if they pertain to larger uh, research uh, issues, then Asad's office will uh, will definitely help. Great. So I can comment on this one, Uzair, as well. Uh, we are also launching the trial 360 degree, and we are going to put together the SOPs. And I have been in the industry, so I have a lot of SOPs. So we can uh, we can certainly share and help. Thank you, Umar. Uh, there, there is another question uh, that is about the capacity building. So. 
someone is asking do you have any capacity building activity online which is of course should be the global one and the people they can take advantage do you have any such facility available uh, right now we have been doing uh, 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 things in person basically and those activities stopped when we when, when covid arrived uh, we are now translating many of these to online um, uh, perhaps Asad can speak a little bit more to this than, than I can. Asad, if you will like to step in. Sure. So, so um, we have a few uh, capacity building grants from NIH as well. Um, so there is a there are multiple D forty threes that we have uh, at AKU uh, that we are doing. We also uh, did a series of which were super popular. Uh, uh, capacity building workshops on grant management uh, at other institutions in Pakistan because we have significant experience and uh, credibility, uh, you know, uh, much uh, what Dr. Putta built uh, in his, uh, you know, in, uh, here and, and that team has been kind of going out and, and doing these workshops. Uh, which have been very popular. So we we do these, but you know these are uh, done on case by case basis. We don't have a routine set of calendars, uh, as you can imagine, because you know these things are done when you have a a grant and and as part of that, because you can't really do a, or at least we don't do like a masters of grants management, which I think even in the U.S. there are very few programs on. Yes, Professor Said, you had mentioned you would like to add something to it. No, that's fine. Uh, Dr. Azar, let's, let's just move from here. Okay, perfect. So great. So uh, before, you know, moving towards the closing. So today we take this honor and pride that the formal thanks should be extended by Professor Sarvat Hussain, which is a little unusual, but he, because of his emotional belonging with the Aya Khan University. So that's going to be very uh, emotional. Thank you. So go ahead. Well, can, I comment, can, can I comment one thing? Um, Dr. Hamid, uh, congratulations, especially if you're uh, Al Dever, uh, Al uh, uh, Tribe. Uh, I really wish you the best because you like recovered a 55 out of 400. And I hope that FDA will consider you for the audit and that will certify or validate your uh, efforts you have been doing so far. Thank you. Thank you. There, before uh, Dr. Sarvath uh, finishes it off, can I make one suggestion? I'd sure, I'd sure, put that sure, in the chat. Sure. So, since you've asked me to join this session, Saeed and Asad, I'd like to propose that we take this forward to sort out this conundrum between DRAP and uh, the Health Research Institute, which is now at uh, the NIH and to come to some formal official agreement that we could push through on what studies need to go to DRAP and what studies should not go to DRAP. At the moment, it is a completely confused mass of protoplasm out there. I mean, you know, and you and I both <laughs> know uh, uh, DRAP people. They are very fine people. They are well-meaning people. We have served on DRAP committees, but they're also overwhelmed and they, they do not differentiate at this point in time there is a committee that has now been notified. Was that correct? That committee that yes. has was pending for a year has now been notified. Yes. It has got some very sensible people, but it's got provincial representation. So I'm proposing, and I'll be willing to support this any, any which way I can that I'll organize a one-day consultation in Islamabad before our next NIH board meeting, where we bring the DRAP leadership, the ministry folks, and the HRI folks together to actually agree, discuss and agree on how they can divide and conquer. And, and the reason for that is very simple, that we just can't afford unnecessary delays because people sitting outside the country don't know the difference between the two. I mean, there are some studies that don't absolutely need to go to DRAP at all. I don't see why DRAP should be certifying studies for or sites for community-based trials, which have nothing to do with drugs or, or new, new molecules. But at this point in time, there is no differentiation. So if you were willing to do some of the groundwork on that, 
then I will be more than happy to help you organize this consultation in December. And we can maybe make more difference than otherwise just by lamenting and, and self-flagellation. Thank you. Absolutely agreed, uh, Dr. Bhutta. I will be very happy to, uh, to, uh, to, to shoulder this with you uh, under your direction. And I think this, this will be a very important step. Let's get all the stakeholders together on one platform. Well, with that, uh, I just wanted to say a few comments and that is it is uh, probably the gold medal recipient presentation of our uh, APNA uh, merit uh, for the last, uh, that we've been doing this for the last uh, uh, close to 15, 16 months and dozens and dozens of those. And especially because it is from Pakistan and, and genuine uh, research and uh, uh, done at a place where <clears throat> I have very strong emotional and historic and nostalgic uh, relationship. And um, there, many times after I left, I uh, thought that I should, you know, go back to Aga Khan, which I did try to uh, at, uh, I think it was in 2010 or so, but it didn't pan out. But nevertheless, uh, I've never been away from emotionally and otherwise, uh, and good wishes for Aga Khan University and see where people have gotten to. I mean, you know, Dr. Bhutta is, is uh, a shining example of what the uh, Aga Khan has produced along with uh, Anita Zaidi, uh, look at Anita, and of course, you know, uh, Professor, uh, Professor uh, Saeed Hamid himself and Asad, I don't remember, what, which year Asad was uh, graduated? Asad, what, which year were you? It was 2001. Oh, 2001. Oh, okay. So, okay, okay. Then uh, I won't tell you which year I graduated. Though. So, uh, <laughs> once again, 1969. And uh, I've, I've actually, uh, you know, disclosed something that I've been keeping to my heart only because this is from Aga Khan University. So, uh, with <laughs> with a with lot of pride and a lot of love and a lot of respect and a uh, lot of whole, wholesomeness on my part. I thank you very, very much indeed for coming over and, and giving us enlightening us. Thank you again very much. You, you, still, still, look you still look young. Uh, but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, so, uh, so I think uh, we are a little over time. So thank you, Dr. Sarvat, for the, your vote of thanks. And again, thank you so much for Dr. Saeed Amid and Dr. Asad Ali for sharing and Dr. Zulfiqar Bhutta for joining uh, while he was on travel and for our panelists, Dr. Zaid and Dr. Omar Hayat for always being there. And inshallah, we'll meet next Saturday uh, with another exciting episode of uh, clinical research in, in Pakistan. Thank you so much, everyone. And assalamu alaikum. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you very much.